Hi there, everyone. It's Christine. Welcome to this first episode of Feminist Talk Back, the show where we have a few feminists on to give their viewpoints to, on issues and topics and also to answer some questions. And in the first episode, I'm really pleased to welcome two guests, Jody of the channel Jody Sinead and Michael of the channel Michael Rollins. Jody, would you like to say hi to everyone and tell us a little bit about your latest video? Um, hi, I'm Jodie. Uh, my latest video was about cultural appropriation. Um, I think that's a pretty big topic around Halloween. Um, appropriate topic? Yeah, a very appropriate topic. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. I that, was exactly, yeah, that was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> and yeah. What's going on on your channel lately? Uh, it's been a whole lot of nothing, to be honest. I've been, um, uh, I'm currently preparing to fly to Singapore and work on a cruise ship. So uh, I need to make one final video sort of telling people what I'm up to because the next four months is going to be kind of radio silence for me, to be honest. <laughs> um, but the latest thing, I suppose, I did a hangout with a, with a guy called Esau and a guy called the Atheist Penguin. And we just kind of talked. They had a whole bunch of questions for me. Um, they, I mean, they they didn't associate themselves as anti-feminist, but it's what they seemed like they were. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Well, speaking of questions, we have some from um, our people who saw the promo video. Go. Nope. And what we do, uh, what well, we'll start off our first segment of the show, will be to read out some of these, some of the questions. So the first one we're going to be um, reading is from Hawthorne Seedling and the question is my question when people speak of the feminist movement what form and structure does this movement take to elaborate on the question does this movement exist in a concrete form or is it more like for example the punk rock movement as in being merely an aggregate of all the people who share a common underlying principle and have chosen to identify a certain way yet are often operating autonomously and independently of each other. In fact, is there only one single feminist movement or are there several? Is everyone who identifies as a feminist automatically part of the feminist movement by default? Or can one claim to be a feminist and be independent or outside of the movement? That's a big question, but I have given it to our guests. <laughs> um, and so you might want to take a part of it rather than all of it. But Michael, if it's okay with you, do you want to try to answer some of that question for those questions. Sure <laughs> um, uh, I, I feel like, like you say, it's a big question. Um, and uh, I feel like there's a bunch of different ways it can be answered. But for me, I, there, there are definitely tenets of uh, feminism, things that uh, when, like, for example, if I were to talk to a person and ask them, whether they agreed or disagreed with these things, whether you could tell and say, well, yeah, actually, you're kind of a feminist, um, that, you know, that if you agree with those things, then, yeah, you're going to, you're probably going to be a feminist. I mean, sure, if you want to say you're a feminist, but I mean, because there's plenty of people that, that, um, that say they're feminists and then they say a bunch of stuff and you're like, actually, no, there's, it's not really uh, right. For example, there was a, an episode of um, Sargon of Akkad's um, Why Do People Hate Feminism, where he brings up, who he labels a feminist, um, what was her name? Uh, uh, Camille, Camille Palia. He says, uh, check out this feminist and see what she has to say about this topic. And then she says a whole bunch of stuff. And then I went off and I had a look at some of the other things that she is quoted as saying. Um, and she's very much not what we would talk of as a feminist. She had some very uh, sketchy ideas about consent, some very sketchy ideas about... Um, about abuse like uh yeah about um like domestic abuse and things like that things that you wouldn't really um think a feminist would say um now more recently i've kind of uh come uh, been aware of this idea of different waves of feminism and and the fact that some old old school feminists who are like second wave uh i don't know if there's any first but actually to be fair i think camille Pal uh, palia wanted to be a first wave feminist that's the thing that she wanted feminism to go back to is to the first wave of feminism um and uh to to say that someone is a feminist because they're a first wave feminist when we took when we 
uh, when I think of feminists and the feminists that I associate with, I think of third wave feminism as an inter intersectional feminism, which is very inclusive uh, and, and the newest kind of um, form of that, that feminism. And um, when someone says, hey, I'm a feminist, but I'm a first wave feminist, it's kind of like saying, yeah, I'm a doctor, but um, I only practice medicine from the early 19th century. So, um, so that's cool. Um, and I don't think it really works. Uh, it, it, the things don't really gel. So, um, yeah, that would yeah. be. I'm trying to have a look at the rest of the thing. Maybe you guys can talk for a bit. No. Yeah, I also wanted to say to Jody that because I could hear Michael in the background coming through in your mic, I muted you. But if at any point you want to say something, take off your mute. And of course, when I'm done answering the question, I'll take your mic off or your mute off and then we'll be able to listen to you. So in terms of answering the question, I'm going to go more vague because if you think about how we have these identifications, I think about the difference between identifying as a feminist and identifying as a member of, say, in the United States, or the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. There are people like me who identify as a Democrat, you know, identify as a Democratic voter, but I don't pay party memberships. I, I don't do anything that's officially involved with the party. You know, somebody who does pay their dues and goes to the meeting and goes to the convention, they're a different kind of Democratic Party member in that they have a more, you know, like they're being part of an official organization. Whereas mine is a bit more ad hoc and there's no one telling me what I can or can't believe. It's not like being a Catholic, you know, um, even though a lot of Catholics in the United States don't agree with the Pope on things like contraception and divorce. But there is a, a dogma there that you know about when you sign up for it. Whereas I think there's, you know, when you're a feminist, it is more like what he was comparing it to with the punk rock music, which is you get a lot of people who have um, a similar uh, end goal in terms of equality or what they, how they envision it, but there are an, is an understanding of paying attention to how the sexes interact and how gender norms influence that and whether those are healthy and productive or oppressive and destructive. Whether you do it from a Marxist point of view or a liberal point of view or an intersectional point of view, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a feminism that we all sign up to. I mean, I don't have a card to any feminist organization. Oh, <laughs> I didn't get mine. I moved. Uh, so, damn. yeah, I think the parallels to the punk rock music are, are probably more apt than to say the Democratic Party, you know, and a form, formal membership in that way. But Jody, what do you think? Um, well, I, I think that feminism is pretty much a fluid movement. I mean, obviously there's the kind of core beliefs that most feminists hold, like the whole equality thing. Um, but then, like, you get people who you find have very differing views from you. Like, my best friend, for example, she has very similar views to me, but doesn't identify as a feminist. But there are also people who have different views and don't and do identify as a feminist. So it's kind of yeah, fluid, I guess. And like, um, people like uh, squirts and turfs, like the uh, trans exclusive. I can't say the word, um, exclusive feminists and sex work exclusive feminists, like, they are still feminists, but they don't see, like, certain groups of people as being feminists, feminism, I guess, if that makes any sense. Yeah, um, the way that some Christians would say, unless you believe my version of Christianity, you're not a real Christian. Yeah, exactly. Um, like with the whole and also like um, people tend to say like oh they're not real feminists if they don't have your ideas like I've heard that a lot that um, oh they have this idea so they're not real feminists I mean they could still be real feminists they just don't agree with what you're saying mm -hmm. and yeah I don't think there's any one way of looking at feminism like everyone has their own beliefs whether it's feminism or religion or whatever everyone's different so of course there are going to be people who have very varied views on it michael before we move on to the next question do you want to build on any of that or say anything yeah yeah uh, there's there's a couple of things i mean uh as for like um how you know it i mean the, the thing that that um i always come back to i suppose is that feminism is about equality um and that 
you know, it's about striving to uh, to bring about equal rights for um, for, for all, uh, you know, um, different sorts of people. Um, and so that was the kind of thing that first first got me. But but I I, I went when I went onto the stream the other day, um, I got asked by these guys, why should I be a feminist? They said to me, why should me or them be be a feminist? And and that got me thinking. I thought, well. <clears throat> I don't really think that it matters. Uh, like, if you want to associate as a feminist, that's that's fine. If you don't want to, then also fine. Uh, what really matters is your ideas and the and how you implement those ideas and how the things that you're doing affect other people. You know, um, I try to, um, you know, you know, I I feel like that there's definitely like like I said, there's definitely ideas that that feminists have that and and things that they want to kind of work on as feminism but if you don't want to associate as a feminist it's not you know it's not like a crucifiable offense or something there's no like 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 christy said there's no like inherent dogma that means that you're going to be Kicked out crucified for that movement. yeah exactly and like when you're talking about um the, you know being a democrat just like being a a, dem a member of the democratic party or you know a, a, a dem or a self-identifying as a democrat that doesn't mean that you're going to agree with every other Democrat. You, there, there are going to be issues oh, yeah. and things that you do not agree with. But in the general sense, you can still be a Democrat and disagree with, uh, you know, and, and, and that's one of the cool things is we can talk about that. We can, we can have a discussion uh, with, uh, as, as feminist versus feminist and, and uh, talk about why we disagree about these things and what we can do to kind of, uh, to change that, you know, I I think that's kind of cool. You know, otherwise it's just like this is the thing you need to do, do that. That that's not what feminism is about at all. <laughs> that's a great segue into our next question, which comes from Eric Taxon, who writes, "I'm a feminist, but I still have a question. I just want to say it's fine that you're a feminist, Eric. You can ask questions on the show too." Uh, so he goes on to write, "I can only assume that anti-fem's opinions are as unshakable as my own, because my opinion is derived from how I see the world." How can any feminist expect to change an anti-feminist mind? Have, ha, haven't they thought just as much about the state of society and come to their own conclusions? So I'm going to bat it back because we're doing this in a specific order. So this goes back to Michael. Um, okay. That kind of touches on what you've just, just mentioned, doesn't it? Yeah, I suppose it does. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think if you're looking for, if you try to get beyond the labels to, okay, what parts of equality do we agree on and what parts of equality right. do we disagree on and why do we think that this is a different, why do we differ on our views in this particular sense of what equality is? Yeah. Um, I, I, I kind of need to make a distinction between anti-feminist and like prominent anti-feminist, I suppose. Like, because whenever, whenever someone says anti-feminist, you know, I kind of forget that there's other people besides like Sargon of Akkad and the Armored Skeptic and, you know, you know, all these guys on YouTube who are, who are popular and they talk about, you know, anti-feminism or they, you know, they may not associate as anti-feminist, but they're still people who are anti-feminist and, or, or, you know, even like men's rights activists who are anti-feminist, you know, that, that and I think of it as an action rather than a, a thing, you know, it's a person who is anti feminism you know that and and so that is kind of it seems to me one of their primary things to do sure they they might have ideas and and ways that they think society is and things that they want to do about that but that it manifests in this like rabid anti-feminism it's the the things that they do and the the things that they talk about is primarily led by being anti-feminist oh hey look at what this feminist did aren't they stupid or hey look at what feminism is trying to do let's try and counter that 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 seems like a primary kind of drive for these people and and when and that's why i wanted to distinguish between the prominent ones and maybe you know just some guy who's an anti-feminist you know who associates as an anti-feminist maybe because he I, I i mean again i don't really know what that means but it it's it's um when it's pretty much just there in the name it's it's that's the primary thing your your anti feminism which to me just seems redundant why i mean i uh why base your world view on being i mean it's just a reactionary thing you know um and i think one of the things is, that is quite cool um that curiosity has kind of done recently is kind of reach out to people who have um 
you know, that have similar ideas about men's rights and they want to try and do something because, you know, reaching across the gap, as it were, and and finding some common ground with, with people on the quote unquote other side and get some shit done because, you know, it doesn't seem like being reactionary really gets anything done, you know. I think from my point of view, in terms of like why I put the content I do up, I put on my channel, one is because I find it interesting. And I, in my channel, often try to present things that I don't think, um, either like people haven't heard before or hadn't been presented in that way before, make some kind of, you know, contribution or make a point in a certain way. So I don't really make my content for anti-feminist, but what, what also was a motivator for me to get on YouTube was that I went looking for good feminist content to learn things and other than like sex ed videos you know um there wasn't like historical feminism or political feminism or any sociological stuff i mean there's more of that now because this was you know five or six years ago whatever but um i felt like there was a real gap and so maybe part of the reason people do um you know take uh, end up having similar you know being influenced by the YouTubers they watch in terms of their perspective on what a feminist is or who feminists are, that putting out content by feminists, by me being a feminist, saying this is what I think, this is my feminism, and then you get an authentic alternative that isn't a straw man. And also critiquing some of those anti-feminist channels' content, because I think for a long time they weren't, you know, there were small voices critiquing them, but there's been a growing number of voices kind of critiquing their arguments and the way that they use or don't use evidence. So I think part of my goal is, as a content creator is to put my, my spin on what my feminism is there, it, um, what my feminism is out there, and also to create an alternative in terms of what people can, can see as content. Do I expect to change a bunch of people's minds? No, not so far as they're going to you know, flip to feminism. But maybe they'll see real people. Like this this show is an example. I'm gonna have I, I want to have feminists with various range of, of viewpoints and have talks about a wide range of subjects, um, all different kinds of people who all are you know have feminist roles. So, you know, if we're all getting to the point where we're understanding each other a bit better, that for me is a, a step forward. All right, I'm gonna stop talking now and, and give it over to Jody. Um, yeah, I agree with you quite a bit Christy. Um, I kind of, I make things that I would want to watch and or like what 13 year old me would want to watch and it's not about changing people's views because obviously there are going to be some people who are dead set in their views no matter what, no matter what they hear, see, experience, whatever, they're always going to be set that way and that's fine. That's their life um i'm not there to change things i guess i'm just there to put out what i think my opinions my thoughts my experiences and if i do end up changing someone's mind about something then cool that's that's a win i guess but it's not my main goal and i think a lot of feminists do kind of uh they do try to change the mind of anti-feminists. I, I know I have done in the past. Uh, like I've wanted to be like, oh, I think this, so everyone should think this. But like as I've grown, like I've realised, actually, no, that's very small-minded of me. Like You can't expect everyone to think what you think. And you can't expect everyone to understand what you're feeling what you've experienced and stuff so yeah there will be some people who just don't get what you're talking about don't understand your point of view and that's fine as long as they're not being a dick about it um <laughs> it's a bit too much to ask sometimes isn't it yeah don't be a dick <laughs> um, be nice to me god damn it <laughs> sorry not something Can I, uh... I'm ready to move on to the third question. Well, I, I, had a, I had a couple of more thoughts. About oh, yeah, that, go ahead. That's all. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, first of all, I don't feel like I answered the damn question. Sorry, I went off on a random tangent. So um, changing, actually changing anti-feminist minds. Um, I don't think that uh, I'm going to change any big anti-feminist minds, but I think that, provide, like, like kind of what Christy said, providing uh, an alternative 
to the things that these guys say so that so that people can actually um start looking at what they say in a critical way especially the whole straw manning of feminist thing because i feel like uh frustratingly and so often when i'm talking to people about feminists or whatever the only source they have for um what a feminist would say would be what the anti-feminists say they 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 get their ideas about feminism and what feminists say and all that sort of stuff from these bigger guys from Sargon of Akkad or from the amazing atheist or something who said look this is what the feminists said aren't they friggin' evil uh, and and they don't even you know so recently I made two videos where I um where I took two of the most quoted quotes from Anita Sarkeesian which were listen and believe and um everything is sexist everything is racist everything is homophobic uh, which are always, always, always touted by by anti-feminist people. Look, this is what feminists say, and look, this is the thing that they want you to do. They're just friggin' religious. Um, and uh, I went and I found the original source. And when I say I found the original source, um, Sean and Jen, who's another channel, he actually found the first original source. So all credit to him. Um, but found the original video and looked at the greater context of what she was actually saying. And when you actually look at the what the people are actually saying rather than what they've been strawmanders by um, various anti-feminists around the place. Um, the context uh, sort of adds some lights to, to what's actually being said and, and shows you that, no, she's not actually saying, listen and believe, do my bidding. Um, it, she's, she's saying something completely different from that. So, so I think that's um, kind of one of the things that I aim to do with, with my content is to, is to o offer an alternative um, you know, perspective, I suppose, of, of, of what these guys actually say, because a lot of the time I feel like it's not that accurate. <laughs> um, yeah. I agree. Definitely mm -hmm. agree. Right. That was fantastic, guys. This show was going so well. All right, moving Yay. on. Sorry we, might have to, we might have to make the answers slightly shorter if we're going to keep yeah, this under three hours. That's okay. It's been really good, but I just realized time wise. Uh, so the next question comes from Daisy Pumpkin 231. I'm looking forward to this, she writes. Here Hi, is Daisy. my question. Given that so many arguments from anti-feminists are based on them extrapolating from the dictionary definition of feminism and picking holes in it, for example, name me one right that I have as a man that you don't have as a woman, given that the words equal and rights cause a lot of problems without a clear definition, and given that a lot of feminist concerns are not about rights per se, for example, challenging gender stereotypes and examining social interactions, do you feel that the dictionary definition is failing us? And can we come up with a better definition? So throwing that over to you, Michael, first. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I just typed feminism definition into Google, and uh, the first definition that came out is the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of equality of the sexes. So, you know, when I think of women's rights, yeah, they say, you know, uh, that's such a common retort is show me one right under the law that women don't have under, over men well first of all uh equal bodily you know autonomy uh, so many abortion laws all left right and center so that's one that i can think of straight off the top of my head but but the yeah the idea of of rights um being you know the fact that people aren't going to treat you a different way just because of the law is like that i mean that's like saying you know it's the law not to murder therefore murder isn't a problem you know it's it's just kind of stupid you there are when i think of how uh women or minorities are treated it's not they're not being treated a certain way um maybe not even like consciously it's not like there are people out there going <laughs> i'm gonna fuck over those stupid women Mwah. it's it's more of like an insidious uh you know, subconscious bias that kind of that that affects the way that people, um, on mass, treat women or minorities um, when it comes to various things like uh, employment or um, education or you know any of these kinds of things, um, which I think we'll kind of get into a little bit later with one of the with some of the um, the articles we're going to talk about. Um, yeah, I, so it, it's more about changing the way that people. Uh, you know, think about others, I suppose, rather than being like enshrining it in law. It's 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 a different thing. Yeah. Yes, it's a very different thing. And my thoughts on the matter are there are a lot of them, but I'm going to try to distill it down to the main point for the interest of keeping the show under three hours. 
I often make an analogy between the word feminism and the word democracy, right? Because the feminism that's described there in the dictionary is the word that was invented to describe the movement in the 19th century. It was the, the uh, movement to get women legal recognition. That was their first step to becoming liberated, but women still needed economic liberation and liberation in the social sphere to be able to go into the public spaces, to be able to run for office, these kinds of things. Um, if we were to go by a dictionary definition, you know, based on the historical concept of democracy, we would have to say that, you know, a democracy is a, a place where only free men can vote, <laughs> because that was what democracy originally was. And obviously, democracy has become a much bigger idea. It's a principle now. It has a lot of different components. There are ways that we as social scientists evaluate how democratic a government is. And we have these measures that we've made up to kind of say what is, um, you know, like a transparent democracy. It has free, fair, free, and frequent elections, for instance, in these different categories. Feminism is the same way. It's become so much bigger in terms of the, its scope. And yes, while the de definition in the dictionary is accurate to the origins of the word, we can't, as human beings, obviously limit ourselves to dictionary definitions. And this is where you do have to read about theory and concepts and history and understand how it evolved as a, an idea. The places where feminism go now were never thought of in the 19th century. You know, it was ridiculous for women to wear pants. A woman who like went out with her first sort of long, puffy, sort of like MC Hammer, I, I picture it, kind of uh, pantaloons, was so abused verbally that uh, you know, she eventually gave it up because the society around her, men and women, shamed her out of doing it. So, you know, um, the idea of women having dress autonomy was not part of their worldview, but it is part of ours. So I said I was going to be short. I will, in the interest of time, let Jody speak to this question. Um, well, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with everything that's been said. Um, I, I don't think that going by a dictionary definition, whether it's the current dictionary definition or a dictionary definition of feminism that may exist in the future, you shouldn't just go on that one little like sentence in a in the dictionary. Like it's it's very narrow minded to just go by a dictionary definition de definition um, because it it's so much bigger than that. It, like you said, it's about the history. It's about the ideologies. It's about all the things that have come in like even the past like five years or something like it's always kind of growing and changing and stuff and you can't just fit that into a dictionary like there are there are so many books written about feminism feminist theory whatever and yeah it, it can't all just fit into one or two sentences in a dictionary so whether it is whether we whether we do change the uh definition of it or not i don't think that matters because you shouldn't go by def dictionary definitions for anything as in depth as such a broad ideology as feminism or any ideology for that matter i think that was very well said Did yeah that was great uh, i just wanted to say i feel like it's irrelevant because it's a, it's it's the same sort of argument as going why is it called feminism if it's about equality? It's just kind of a gotcha, you know. It's 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 the small little thing. I'm not saying that that's what uh, Daisy was doing. I'm just saying that that um, you know, it's you, you can't you know compress the hundreds of years of ideas and and all that sort of shit into just a tiny little. That, that's basically what Jody said. But I, I think about it the same with the with the feminism thing. You know, it's, it's like well, well, mm, shut up. I remember either on a hangout with Garrett or with Garrett in a hangout, he talked, there's actually a, fall, a fallacy and there's two words in it. One is like dictionary, but it's basically when you, um, it's, it's a logical fallacy. You present a narrow dictionary definition of a concept in order to sort of straw man it and tear it down. Um, and yeah, there is, I think, the, the more, maybe the people who are entry level anti-feminists might drop those bombs, but I think they probably get tired of them. Well, maybe not after a while. Argumentum ad dictionarium? Is that the one? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> Makes me sound super smart, right? <laughs> cool. It's amazing. Argument ad dictionarium. 
Well, the next one is a, is a multi-part question and there's only one more after that. So the next question comes from, uh, this is a good German last name, Matt Hollisch. Hollisch. <laughs> Hollisch. And he writes, I have a line of questions that build off one another. One, do you believe, do you have to believe in the existence of the patriarchy in order to be a feminist? Two, if so, does this mean that the standard definition of feminism is incomplete at best? Three, if not, then why is the ideology called feminism? Four, hypothetically, if one believed in the existence of an oppressive matriarchy as opposed to patriarchy, would it be a more appropriate would it be more appropriate to name ideology dedicated to achieving gender equality as masculinism or masculinism? Sorry. I'm gonna do a panel chairs privilege here and I'm gonna have a go at these first. So um, number one, do you have to believe in the existence of the patriarchy in order to be a feminist? I don't think so because I was a feminist long before I understood the concept of patriarchy. I was probably a self-identifying feminist at 17, mostly based off of my a reaction to how the Catholic Church treat, treat, treats women and treated me as a woman and treated my, my mother who got divorced and everything else. So um, no, one does not need to believe in the existence of patriarchy in order to be a feminist. However, as I've said in tweets, like the theory of evolution, patriarchy is both a theory and a fact. It's something we can observe and it's something for which we have a causal explanation to kind of explain our observation. So if so, does it mean the standard if you, so if you have to believe in it, does it mean the standard definition of feminism is in, inadequate or incomplete at best? I think we've talked about the definition of feminism in the prior question, so I think we've answered that question. If not, then why is the ideology called feminism? Well, if you look up the word ideology, it's a set of ideas that hang together. And any, you know, like um, capitalism is an ideology. Uh, you can have democratic, you know, democracy as an ideology. and Feminism is a set of ideas that hang together. And so you can have feminist theory, which is an attempt to account for things in, that we observe. You can have feminist ideology, which are the principles and values. So it's perfectly acceptable to call feminism an, an ideology. And then if there was a matriarchy as opposed to a patriarchy, would it be appropriate to name it masculinism? Well, again, that would depend on, as I said in the previous question, the history of the word feminism comes from the 19th century right movement to gain women their legal rights. Um, so if it was a matriarchy, then presumably men would be the ones without all of the rights and women would have all the property and the power and they would be the people in government and in the churches and running all of the financial institutions and men would be marginalized without legal representation or recourse, then yeah. So, um, if everything in society was completely different, should yeah. we name it something different? <laughs> <laughs> so that was my go. Um, I don't know, Michael, are you ready to, is there anything uh, that was good. to that? Uh, yeah, that was really great. Um, uh, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it sounds like, uh, like you could have compressed that down to why is it called feminism, basically, um, and does patriarchy exist? Um, well, I mean, I suppose um, one of the things I'd like to say is, is people don't understand patriarchy when when they argue against it. Um, I, I people are like why if you know you know patriarchy there's no like group of people you know, st sitting on a on a throne telling women what to do. It's it's it, yeah, that's not what patriarchy is. I, I feel like people always straw man it when they when they go to talk about it. Sargon of Akkad did it. I, sorry, I go back to Sargon all the time because he's one of the people I focused on. But his his whole video about patriarchy. Um, well, first of all, he just grabs a dictionary definition, which isn't a uh, one that a feminist would use, and then he takes that apart, um, and then he goes on about some other weird meritocracy bullshit. So um, I feel like if you're gonna, uh, this is something that I I kind of thought of the other day as well when I was talking to these guys, is that that it appears to me that some people they just they they um, uh, what's the word? They disregard certain concepts, even though they don't even understand what the fuck they are. So patriarchy, for one, um, you know, privilege and oppression. They go, oh, you know, you, you say to one of these guys, okay, explain to me what patriarchy is. Explain to me what a feminist means by patriarchy. They can't do it. So how can you then go, well, I don't think, I think it's a bunch of a crock of shit. Well, you can't think something's a crock of shit if you don't even freaking understand it. Um, so I would suggest to, to, to Matt Froelich here, uh, that he maybe goes and reads a book or two about um, 
patriarch. And I don't mean that in a condescending way. I'm sorry that came came off kind of uh, like oh, read a fucking book. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, um, if you really want to understand, and then if you know, you feel free to discredit, uh, you know, disregard it after that. But maybe read a couple of books on patriarchy theory because it's a it's a bigger uh, it's a bigger thing than a dictionary definition. <laughs> it's not just a dictionary definition. I think yeah. part of the problem is that there isn't like a, a handbook on patriarchy. You know, if you want to yeah. look up things on patriarchy, they're generally in textbooks or they're they're referenced as concepts in academic articles, which might be behind paywalls. And that was what was the impetus behind my series, Evidence that Patriarchy is a Real Thing, because I think people tend to, as you say, think of it as a as a conscious conspiracy that people are yeah, engaged yeah. in. Yeah. And my point is, it's these little everyday things that are all around us, like Steve or Steve, Pastor Stephen Anderson, There's, you know, his attitudes toward women and the way that women live in those churches, in his church, and their attitudes toward it. It's going on right now. Or the laws on child brides, which affect you know, 90% of the children who are married under the age of 16 are, are 90% are girls and 10% are boys. But the law itself that feminists are addressing is non-gendered. Um, so, or, yeah, um, or abortion. Kind of abortion now, I, yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, I interrupted you, I think, unless you were finished. No, that's pretty much done. Okay. Jody. Um Again, you said a lot of what I was going to say, which isn't a bad thing, don't worry. Um, <laughs> you probably said it better than I could anyway. Um, but yeah, it's having the existence of the patriarchy, like you said, it's not just a theory, it's fact that we can see all around us if you actually know how to look at it, if that makes sense. Like... Um, Oh yeah, if I know. You, know. you have to have the the concepts and the analytical tools to be able to yeah. recognize patterns when they appear. Yeah, exactly. Because like, if someone told me something about a car, for example, I'm no good with cars. If someone said, "Oh yeah, you can see the the something is off on that car," but is it? <laughs> like, I I don't know. Uh, okay, sure. Like it. I guess it's kind of the same thing, like, oh yeah, patriarchy is a thing, but is it? What What is the patriarchy? Like, how how is it a thing? So if you don't understand it, I guess you can't really see it. Um, it's like the magic eyes, those things that were fashionable about 15 years ago with the 3D pictures. And you could look at it and just see a series of lines, or if you looked kind of past it, you're looking at the same thing. You're just like, oh, there's something there that I didn't see before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, that that's what I have to say about the patriarchy. Do you, um, do you think? Um, sorry to interrupt. I, uh, I think but this is a question for both of you. But do you think that um, you know, in in the sense of 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 being able to see it, um, that do you think that that like empathy and um and and trying to understand the experiences of different people is something that factors into that you know like i feel like a lot of the time people who are against you know people quote unquote on the other side they have a serious lack of empathy or 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 willingness to understand the experiences of other people and when for example a woman or you know people talk up about things that um that affect them in in a way you know so uh you know here's this thing that i experienced um it's just another you know, another piece of evidence for the patriarchy, they get a resounding "shut up, stop being so friggin' sensitive." <laughs> what, what, what yeah, what no, you... I think I think you're right. Yeah, um, empathy does play into it. I reckon because yeah, if you're not empathetic to anyone, then why would you care like what's going on with anyone else? Why would you care that the patriarchy is a thing if you're not being affected by it, or and you don't care about the people who are affected by it? So yeah. I reckon empathy does play into that. Uh, but it's a very unscientific thing. <laughs> Definitely. Empathy isn't scientific. <laughs> I don't care if it's not scientific, God damn it, it's a thing. <laughs> I was reminded when you guys were talking of the film, the documentary that we did, the discussion on the, the mask you live in, where we talked about um, toxic masculinity. And one of the things that really made a lot more sense to me after watching that about the way that the, the way that toxic 
the way that masculine norms that are associated with emotional repression and dominance and violence and like extreme sexual virility. Um, I understood my comment section a lot more <laughs> because the kind of abusive <laughs> derogatory comments and also on the friend, my, my male friends, my guy friends who make feminist videos, it's that mindset of, you know, um, don't be weak, don't cry, suck it up, be a man, um, learn to take it, uh, you know, fight back if someone's done something to you, violence or aggression is the way to solve it. And so maybe part of the problem isn't it's that you know, empathy in that way has been taught or drilled out of them. And so it's hard to value right. something that's associated right. then with the feminine, which is softness, empathy, emotional vulnerability. Yeah. So that's something I, I found kind of difficult uh, the other day is, is uh, the, the atheist penguin brought up the fact that he is totally for, uh, when he said it, I was like, are you being serious? He said he's totally for like constant, uh, you know, uh, unending drone strikes of the Middle East, um, you know, ag against places that we know are terrorist threats. And I was like, what? Uh, just like you said, Christy, this idea of, you know, suck it up and just fucking be violent. <laughs> it's like, what? They, you, 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 your solution to this problem is just to fucking bomb a whole bunch of Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that pretty much stands on its own. Are, are we ready to move on to our last question? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah? All right. So this is from Timmy Turdberger, who asked this question, and I was rather, <laughs> it is, it's, it's Timmy Turdberger. He asked this question. I was rather suspicious of it, but in a response, he convinced me of his sincerity, so I'm including it in the show. So he says, I only have one question. I'd be very grateful if this was answered. So thank you, Timmy, for making a good defense against my rather, like, what are you on about? Um, response. Here's the question. Do I have the option of, I'm sorry, do I have the option to decline or disagree with feminists or any other social justice movements without receiving a bigoted label? Yes. My, <laughs> I, I would say also, yes. It's how you yeah, do it. Pretty much. If, yeah, if you don't say things that are bigoted or hurtful or designed to you know, degrade the humanity of the person that you're writing to, you probably won't have any problems. Even if you degrade their humanity, that's not necessarily going to get you called a bigot. But if you say something that's bigoted, then yeah. But, you know, feminists disagree with other feminists. People who are, advocate social justice have different ideas of what that would look like and how to get there. I'm, I'm sure there are, like, some people who would, like, automatically say, like, oh, you're a bigot if you don't agree with them. But not that i don't think that's the majority of people so like if you do like find people like that then sorry but <laughs> yeah i no, want to know if like this idea because I, I hear this a lot from again unquote unquote the other side but the the fact that as soon as you disagree with a feminist you get labeled a sexist or a racist and i want to know whether i want to know where that's coming from whether that that is because people are throwing around sexist and racist too much or is it because these people just say a lot of sexist and racist shit, so they're getting called. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, we talked about this in our answers to the to the questions thing, or the answers to the answers to the questions, where where sexism and racism uh, are broader than than people seem to think they are. They're not just, you know, racism isn't just being part of the KKK. You know, there's 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 other things that you can do or say that can be racist and and um that doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person and it doesn't mean that it's an and it's also it's not an insult it's it's it, for me when like if someone says you know hey you're being offensive or you're being racist or you're being sexist or whatever i don't go oh god fuck, that stop called racist nah. I, I i i want to then go and have a look and take a look at myself and the things that i'm saying and maybe assess those because maybe the thing that i did say was a sexist thing to say you know and like I say, just because you said a sexist thing doesn't mean you are a sexist, I suppose. I mean, I, I suppose if you have a big buildup of sexist things that you would say and you're doing it all the time, then maybe, yes, you are a sexist. But, but again, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not just an insult to make you feel bad. It's a thing, fr from where I'm sitting anyway, it, it's, it's something that should make you assess your ideas and the way you're thinking about things and think, well, maybe the things that I'm doing slash saying are kind of sexist. Maybe yeah, I should 
change something, you know? If I was standing next to you in the bar and you farted, and I went, you farted? Would you suddenly go, you can't say that to me? <laughs> like, but you did. Like, it's yeah. you know. But no, disagreeing with a feminist or, dis- you know, that is not inherently a sexist thing. I think the, the, the confusion comes with, uh, like, for me, I feel like, uh, um, you know, spreading ideas like the patriarchy isn't real or there's no such thing as a wage gap or there's no rape culture, it, you know, uh, spreading those ideas and, and you know, uh, kind of, yeah, sp- spreading the, the, the antithesis of those ideas, I suppose, to me, I think is inherently sexist because you are you are conti- you are furthering um, the oppression of women. Basically, that's where, where it's getting at. You, you're saying, especially if you're a, a big uh, voice, say like the the amazing atheist, where you say this thing and it it affirms the ideas in your followers that, in in fact, no, that there, there's no so we don't have a problem with consent and rape and all that sort of stuff. That's furthering the problem. And therefore, it's, you you are being sexist in that sense. So, so not disagreeing with feminists per se, but 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 you know that thing that I just said before that. Right. Okay, Jody, do you want to come in before we move on to the next uh, segment? Um. No, I think I said what I want to say, and you said what I want to say as well. So, nah, carry on. <laughs> Great. Well, <laughs> sorry, I talked so much. Don't no worry. <laughs> well, this is going to be your last show for a while, so we're going to let you over. Yeah, true story. Time. True story. You can, yeah. you can just like take out snippets and put them in, in later shows. So I'll be, <laughs> so be there too. I've set it up to be spread out across four months, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this wasn't on the schedule because I forgot to put it on there, but we did discuss before having an update on some good news in terms of the YouTube community and the reduction of harassment following specific practices. So I don't know if sure. we, we don't have to name any names. Yeah, but um, I wanted to just acknowledge as a really positive thing that I'm grateful for that a certain YouTuber whose fans can be over enthusiastic um, <laughs> in the last uh, couple videos that came out, there wasn't a link to the original video. And we've been having a look at how those videos that he commented on are doing and the amount of uh, negative feedback dropped considerably. And that's a really positive thing uh, for free speech and yes, and freedom of expression on YouTube. So I wanted to make that positive acknowledgement out there because I'm, I for one am grateful for it. Yes, well done. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to move on to the second section of the this show. And that's going to be you where like we have... like transition music? Uh, yeah, I'll need some. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Now for the next topic. We're going to answer. We decided that we had a. Uh, we often get questions as feminist YouTubers that get asked over and over and over. And we wanted to, in this initial show, address some of these most common questions. Now, Jody, you have a list, and I don't know if you have it to hand. I have it to hand, but it would be nice uh, since you kind of made it up. Um, I couldn't find the list. Oh, okay. All right. So I've got it here. I've got it ready because I'm running the show. So I needed to have everything. Uh, this, I can. Yeah. Is the list the just the stuff that I, I sent you? Because I yes. don't have any other list other than that. But yeah. yeah, I do have that to hand. Okay. Do you want to uh, read out the first one? And or we'll, and then uh, we'll have a little chat about each each person. I'll can just get... fly by the seat of my pants, shall I? It's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the first question that I have here is, why do feminists hate men? <laughs> As a man, yeah. I personally hate myself. Uh, <laughs> From my oh. <laughs> did you want to finish up, Michael? Yeah, give more of a more of an answer or a serious answer. I, Either, exactly. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to budge over top, but I suppose I should. Um, being a man and all. Um, the, <laughs> uh, I think it's absurd for two reasons. One of them is is this side, you know, uh, and I think Christiosity. Um, said it quite nicely. I can't remember exactly what she said, so I'll paraphrase her. Um, but it was basically, I have a husband and two lovely boys, and the insinuation that I hate them is uh, is is awful. And you, you obviously don't know what the hell you're talking about. So uh, I think it's absurd in that sense it, that that feminists hate men because it kind of implies that they are these kind of lonely, 
uh, you know, closeted women who don't interact with anyone else but but other, you know, closeted, uh, you know, gross women who don't like society. I don't know, something stupid like that. It, um, so I think it's absurd in that sense. In the other sense, I think it's absurd because whenever I've heard any evidence for for feminist hating men, it's not actually feminist hating men. It's feminist, uh, you know, trying to point out male privilege, I suppose, and, and being against that. That's kind of what my argument is. Jodie, how about you? Uh, yeah, it's absurd to say that all feminists hate men. Yeah, there will probably be some feminists out there who do hate men. I'm not one of them, and personally I don't know any other feminist uh, that does hate men, so uh, yeah, that's just absurd. Um, yeah, I have a boyfriend, I've had boyfriends in the past, and I haven't hated them at least when I started the relationship. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it's not about hate, it's about equality. And you can't really hate someone just because of their gender. That's kind of what we're fighting against. Uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, no. Feminists don't hate men inherently. <laughs> Right, I think the confusion comes when we do when people use terms like you know patriarchal patriarchal power structures or patriarchy, that because we're talking about male dominated positions of power and influence and status, that every guy who hears it thinks that we're talking about him, and I just want to say it's not about you. It's not all about you, you know. Um, just like when it comes to issues of racism. It's, you know, there are uncomfortable truths that I have to face as a white person about what people who with my skin color did in the past and those structures that I've inherited because of, and have benefited from because of the color of my birth. But I don't take that on personally that I'm being called a racist when institutions and pr pr problems are being pointed out. So just kind of step back and think about more of it as less about the individual level and more about the social structures and the people at the top. Um, who or some people in powerful positions making decisions, but yeah, I think that was that's my main objection to this idea that feminists hate men because I think there's a conflation there with the with patriarchy and individual men who are like you know working at office max or you know have a job at an insurance company, you know there's so that's yeah my my perspective on that one. Can I just put in that that uh, there is a long and proud tradition of anti-feminists saying that feminists hate men like even since since the inception of feminism there's been propaganda um <coughs> floating around uh trying to dissuade you know well I, I think in in the first place it was like um anti-feminist warning men that their their that their wife might become a feminist because if they do then they're going to start hating men you know there's posters and shit from back in the early 1900s of yeah, oh, watch out for those man hating feminists. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not it's not a new thought either. <laughs> right. The only thing that's new is now that we have MGTOWs. Um, the guys uh -huh. have their own versions <laughs> of the extreme. Yeah. But they just won't friggin' go their own way. Why won't they go their own way? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Stop whining about it. <laughs> so the next one, Jody. Um, why are all feminist lesbians? Like Michael, Mike, Michael, why are you a lesbian? Oh, it's just so uh, t appealing, you know. Just lesbian is a... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> this is the comedy part of the of the hangout, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not we're not all lesbians, right? <laughs> there are more in my circle. I know more guys who are feminists on YouTube. Than, than women, you know, like helping, looking for other women to connect with, you know, so. Yeah. I don't know where this, this lesbian, I mean, I suppose the lesbian thing comes from the hating men thing as well. So they, you know, it's, it's get rid of men, everyone become lesbians because women are superior. I think that's the, where it's coming from, do you think? Because it's, it's kind of a strange assertion. <laughs> yeah, it's an aberration. It's showing them as sexual deviants. Um, you know, they're not proper uh, yeah, women. Yeah. That kind of thing. I, I do know that um, I watched a documentary, I can't remember the name of it, but 
I watched a documentary a couple of weeks ago, and it was kind of looking back at the um, uh, the sixties, the I guess that's second wave feminism. Yeah. Um, and part of like a little part of that was uh, feminists, uh, le- lesbian feminists coming together as a group, um, and some people they did actually say like oh, you shouldn't sleep with men because they're the enemy. So I guess that that idea of that tiny little group of feminists back in the 60s has, like, bled through to today and blown up to all proportions. And so now apparently all feminists are lesbians, which, yeah, there are some lesbian feminists, but there are also straight ones, there are also bisexual ones, there are also asexual ones, like, yeah. (laughs) Is that, this, is that this idea of political lesbianism? Exactly. Is that... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, right, okay. Well, yeah, see, I think that's one of those kind of rad meme things, right? Yeah. Yeah, and again, it's, it's, it's sort of the inverse of MGTOW. MGTOW is basically political lesbianism for men. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> except, they, except they don't want to sleep with men. They want to sleep with women because all their worth, the only thing they have of worth is, is, is their vaginas. That's... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so moving on to the third question. Um, why is it called feminism if it's about equality? Oh. We we didn't this one already, so. Yeah. Next one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, aren't women already equal? No. Nah, we're Next not. Question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, because again, Maybe because of the association with first wave feminism, you know, people are, well, you got the vote. <laughs> you know, got the right to have a bank account. Except now people want to take it away. People are like, <laughs> like Anne Coulter. Yeah. Um, but, uh, sorry. Yeah, this idea, you pointed out there's reproductive rights that are an issue. And feminism isn't just about legal rights. It's about, as you pointed out, too, I think when talking about intersectionality, it's culture, it's social, it's, it's the fact that, you know, having. Uh, baby changing areas in men's toilets as well so men can be fathers. For me, that's a really feminist thing because mm-hmm. it's empowering parents, both men and women. So, um, yeah, no, no, like women aren't equal and there are ways that men are unequal. And that's more often than not, especially for men, in the social areas when it comes to family and fatherhood and nurturing, those kinds of things. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. This yeah. This is the rapid fire round where we only talk for five right. minutes on a question. Lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a Steve call out there. Yeah. Next one. Um, why don't feminists talk about women in the third world? They do. Next yeah. <laughs> well, I was wondering, you know, given all of the, I, I just saw uh, someone shared on Facebook today the story actually happened in September where there was. <clears throat> an atheist in Egypt who was given like 2,000 lashes and imprisoned oh, yes. because he, um, yeah, he won't, won't recant his atheism. And I'm just wondering, you know, with atheists being silenced by Islamic or dominantly, predominantly Muslim governments in the Middle East, why are people talking about Milo Yiannopoulos not being able to give a speech on a campus? Surely mm-hmm. there are bigger problems of free speech in the, in the Islamic world than in the West, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, I, um, I know for me, like, I do, like, think about women in the third world, and I have, like, I don't know, signed petitions and stuff, and I have, like, talked about it, but I mainly focus on, like, what's happening around me and what I've, like, heard about in the news, because that's what I've experienced, so I'm going by what I know. If I was living in the, like, Middle East or something, then maybe I'd have different experiences and I'd be able to talk about them with some kind of authority, but I don't. And, and it's also a question of resources, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. not like, I mean, how, how, how are, are you supposed, I mean, sure, there are probably some things that you can do, but, you know, be, the, the idea that you should just drop everything and, and, and you know, forget about all these, uh, you know, first world problems and, and go mm. and, fix all the problems in the Middle East. It's just absurd. Yeah, it's, it's also that kind of thing where, like, oh, there's always some, there's someone worse off than you. Like, yeah, there's always yeah. going to be someone worse off than me. 
but why can't I focus on what's happening with me? Like, why does that not matter yeah. if there's something happening worse? Like, I've heard the example of if you've uh, got a really bad headache or something and someone else has got a broken leg, just because they've got a broken leg doesn't mean that you're not in pain as well. Like, sure. it, it's not, you can either... And it doesn't mean that you should, that you should not bit. take any painkillers and just go and, you know, fix their leg. Exactly. You know, <laughs> It's the it's the fallacy of relative privation, right? Uh, and Chrissyosity again. Sorry, I keep going back to Chrissyosity. It's because she's amazing. But um, yeah, uh, she did a really great video on the on the, the the fallacy of relative privation. So I'm not gonna um, try and summarize that here. But that that I think is important. Uh, the other thing I I think is I I feel like whenever an anti-feminist comes forward and says, "Why aren't you doing something about this Middle East problem?" I feel like it's just the most disingenuous bullshit I've ever heard in my life because they're not doing anything about it either. <laughs> they don't actually yeah. give a crap. They don't give a crap about the problems that are facing women in the West. They don't give a crap about the problems that are facing women in the East. And they're just using it as an ammunition against feminists to say, look, they don't fucking care about uh, the Middle East. It's, they're just trying to derail the conversation. Exactly. I would Beyond say, disagreements. yeah, from my, it's terms of, look, we started getting English. Um, <laughs> my content, in terms of why I don't do stuff on Islam all the time, my audience comes 70% from the United States, then the United Kingdom, then Australia, and then some other countries around Europe. The, the king of Saudi Arabia is not watching my channel. People in Dubai mm. are not watching my channel. I have no influence and no ability to change anything. Now, it is the case, you know, like groups in the States, for instance, will work on raising awareness of women's issues in the Middle East. Uh, like in Afghanistan and girls not being taught and all kinds of stuff. But the National Organization of Women is more effective in getting legislation to make sure that girls in New York are protected from human trafficking than they are in changing laws in the Middle East. And so for me, it's also a matter, like you said, of resources, but also effort. And I don't think that, I mean, there are organizations that are dedicated to raising awareness and working on these issues, and we should support them. But it doesn't mean if I talk about it on YouTube, it's going to do any good. Whereas if I talk I, about issues in the West that people aren't aware of, examples of patriarchy, and they're exposed to them, they might disagree with them, but then they've at least been exposed to them. Exactly. I think inherent in that question as well is, is I mean, it, even they say it explicitly, that, that women in the West have it totally fine. And so stop focusing on them when they are equal. They've got equality. So why? So stop doing that and go and go over to the Middle East. And so it's just it, it's just like completely disregarding all this stuff, you know, all these problems to do with, with uh, you know, consent and, and rape and, and, and wage gap and, and all that kind of stuff. Being like, that stuff doesn't matter or it doesn't even exist. It's not a problem. Stop complaining about it and go and do something about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, yeah, disingenuous book. And, and there are even uh, feminists over that, like, that were born in third world countries, that have grown up in third world countries, that are feminist and are doing things over there. And so they're doing stuff. I wonder if people, I wonder if like anti-feminists over there say, oh, stop focusing on yourself, focus on the Western <laughs> women. <laughs> <laughs> I think also like um, maybe, I don't know, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems to me that, because I've heard some other people say stuff like this but like for example if women in the west uh, sorry in the in the east you know in, in muslim countries and whatnot may not even you know have the ideas that you know that they aren't that the, the way that they are being treated is bad and so seeing content from uh you know even talking about women in the west and 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 solving those kinds of problems could be uh, a good thing for them because they can realize that hang on a second you know i'm i'm not being treated quite right and so then they might be driven to do something about it themselves yeah maybe yeah <laughs> yeah i mean there's a lot so, of women obviously who are muslim in the west who have freedoms that they want to make sure women everywhere in the muslim world experience so and yeah. you know, some of those girls are growing up in countries like the states and the UK and things like that, and they might be yeah getting information from YouTube and then questioning, you know their the, their country's culture and connecting with cousins who might still be there and spreading ideas. You know. Mm. Sure. 
Uh, so Lightning round. Know that? Yeah, yeah, because I um I closed uh, the window. So. I have one question left which okay. is going to be answered incredibly quickly. Can men be feminists? Yeah, no, wait. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about this one. Do I have to be a lesbian first? <laughs> I think you might have to be. <laughs> maybe maybe we, could, we could change that guy's original question uh, from do you have to believe in the existence of patriarchy in order to be a feminist? It should be do you have to be a, femi uh, sorry, a lesbian to be a feminist? Uh, and then go from there. <laughs> yeah, it's an example of intersectionality. Yeah, totally. You know, um, when, you know, again, you know, because I'm the oldest person in the room, but, you know, when I was growing up, sort of like, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, I was thinking, can men be feminists? But because, you know, intersectional feminism hadn't really hit me yet at that point. It was still in its nascent days. And, yeah, then it became, of course, it's about a set of ideas. So, yes, people who have lived experiences are able to tell their stories and communicate them so other people can understand them. But then you need allies. And just as with, with uh, against the odds, I'm an ally to people who want to deal with men's issues in, in a gender, you know, from a gendered perspective, because I care about gendered issues. So I'm a good feminist ally on that issue. And you could always say I'm a, I'm a meninist. Well, I don't like the term because of the associations. But if you found a term that worked, that it was, was about um, building up men in the, where there are areas in society where they're deficient or overlooked, that wasn't about also tearing down women. I would gladly say I'm an ally to that movement. Yeah. I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, I Michael, think, you go ahead. Because uh, you're the expert said, on this one. <laughs> ah, I am a man after all. Have the man told, has, a, has a woman ever told you you can't be a feminist because you're a man? Um, I mean, I've. Uh, uh, not really. No. Um. No, oh, I just I, I wanted to say something about the men's rights thing, and and uh, like you were saying, Christy, uh, just that that last bit about um, you know a way to uh, advocate for men's rights without tearing down women, um, which I think is is good is a good idea to get because I feel like that is not what the majority of when we talk about the men's rights movement, their whole thing is tearing down women initially, uh, and then men's rights is kind of a is kind of a, a backseat thing and and maybe that's kind of what they think that feminists are doing i mean that comes with the the kind of hating men thing where you know feminism isn't about bringing about women's rights by tearing down men it's about bringing women up to the to the platform i suppose um so i think that's an important distinction to make yeah we just want all the same things you guys get to have that's all right yeah, yep. we don't want to take them away from you. We don't want to take away your stuff. We just want to go. Hey, that's really cool. Can we do it too? Yeah. We just want all the women loving because we're all lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the final thing, um, each of us have brought a new story that we're going to talk about, and Michael's been going first because again, this is his last hangout for a while. So do you want to start us <laughs> off? Are you you have it ready to go? Yeah, I got it here. I have no idea what I'm going to say, but I'll, I'll go for it. <laughs> I've read this article a couple of times now. Um, it's not very long. So um, it's about women in uh, engineering fields. And this is a, it's an article on, uh, what is it, timeshighereducation.com. Uh, and it's entitled, The Culture of Engineering Does Not Take Women Seriously. Uh, and I think the, cru the crux of the article um, is kind of spelled out quite nicely in this little bit thing here. Uh, I read a... Um, I'm trying to think through the oh, shit. There was a there was a, a sentence that I thought was really good. Uh, anyway, it's about um it's about women in um engineering and and uh on a bigger a uh, whole in STEM fields and um this this particular they they've done studies. It says here our research has begun in 2003 followed 700 engineering students across four universities, um and the research team gathered data. Uh, about the students and um, and about how they were going with the courses, and they also had a bunch of students uh, document their career and their education um, in like a diary kind of thing. And so, and it, one of the things they got from it was that men, uh, that, sorry, that women women were dropping out at a much higher rate uh, from engineering than uh, men were. Um, and uh, it uh, it talks about. Uh, which is one of the things that I think is kind of important to keep in mind when we're talking about um, like um, getting more women into like STEM fields and things like that. People, uh, 
they say, oh, you know, well, there's there's still not enough women in STEM fields, therefore they just must not want to be in those fields. And and I think that's that's kind of an oversimplification of the problem, you know, because like, cause we've got affirmative action or whatever where, you know, it's it's not just about taking a bunch of women and chucking them into STEM fields. It's about changing the the ideas and the environments in those fields uh, which make them hostile towards women. Like previously, um, heavily male-dominated fields like engineering here where where women come in and they feel uh, they feel unwelcome um, throughout the whole process from the, from when they when they first are a child at the age of four or something and saying to their teacher, hey, or four, you know, they don't know the teacher, maybe let's say six. <laughs> they, they say to their teacher, hey, I want to be an engineer. Uh, you know, I want to be an engineer when I grow up. And the teacher going, oh, I love, you know, that that's more of a man thing to do, you know, um, and and going through their education process and meeting hurdles like that along the way, not overtly being stopped by a big sign on the door that says, sorry, no woman welcome, but but th- these little uh, ideas and, and um, uh, you know, mindsets of people who have established that, um, uh, that um, system, uh, you know, that, that, that could, uh, ah, words escape me, but the people who have established that, that field, uh, which make it a hostile environment for women to, to enter into. And so there was just one little example here um, of, uh, you know, it says, uh, uh, women consistently cited these similar experiences. Um, they often felt dismissed within their projects or internships that were, and they were sidelined while their male colleagues dominated the more hands-on tasks while the women uh, were expected to take on more menial and administrative roles. On this topic, one female participant wrote, two girls in a group who had been working on a robot with, uh, we were building in class for a few hours and then the guys in their group came back and within minutes had been uh, had sentenced them to doing menial tasks while the guys went and had all the fun in the machine shop so that's I mean yeah that's kind of the thing that I, I got from all that rant complete yes just to build on that an example in a different industry I posted this um, recently on Facebook uh, about a woman who reported she had joined a law firm and been made partner and yeah. during the ceremony where they sort of like introduced the new partners they gave all of the men, the company, the firm tie, and they gave her a garter. <laughs> and they were surprised oh. when she refused to accept it. Oh my god! Yeah, that that's not sexist at all, is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus! Oh, wow. Okay, good. Yeah. Mm. And it's these sort of like little slaps in the face that add up to make you go, I don't, I don't want to put up with this anymore. I want to find a so, job where they respect me and I don't have to feel mm-hmm. dismissed or made to, you know, put on a sexy object for all the men in the room. Yeah, I, I know I had a friend who, uh, I don't know what work she was in, but her boss was a bit of a uh, creep. And any of the male employees, they were fine with whatever they were wearing. But the women, they had to wear tight skirts and quite short, tight skirts, or they could have got fired. And I remember my friend talking to me about this and was like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, how how can this be going on? It's ridiculous. Yep. And that's why we still need feminism in the West, so that women aren't seen as decorations. You know, if there's a company <laughs> uniform, everyone should wear it, and there should be accommodations for people who want to wear skirts or dresses, men or women, I don't care. Um, you know, uh, but there it should be uniform, and the idea of you know short tight skirts is just yeah. Mm-hmm. So Jody, do you want to take us through your article? Yeah. Uh, again, I, I I don't really know what to say about it other than saying what it is. But um, <laughs> that's the whole point. Yeah, this, I'll give links in the description box yeah. below so people can read them fully. Um. The one I'm going to be talking about, it's entitled In one corner of the law, minorities and women are often valued less. And basically, the article starts out about this four-year-old boy who has become mentally disabled. He, or was it, he's unable to speak and complete sentences or play with other children because of, like, being violent and stuff. And the reason for this is because he had grown up for 
I can't remember how long he grew up there. I think it was maybe a year. It's down the bottom of the article and it's taking forever to scroll down. Um, but yeah, he was one and he had tested positive for lead and it was because all the paint and stuff in the flat that the landlord had been renting out to them had lead in it and so they they were taking this landlord to court and he was made to pay damages to the boy and it was the the amount was worked out originally at 3.4 million dollars which was worked out by um figuring out roughly what the boy could have made had he been uh mentally able i guess um but yeah. the uh the defense team said that it should be about half that because he was hispanic and uh hispanic people don't have a lot of uh master's degrees because it said that uh the proportion of hispanics attaining master's degrees was in the neighborhood of 7.37 percent um however both his parents uh his mother had a master's degree um and they're both graduated from college so like he was in quite a well-educated family regardless of being hispanic but because of his heritage, they halved his um uh what's the word the mm -hmm. estimate um and yeah uh I I would recommend anyone who's watching this to uh go to this thing go to the article because there's a uh a uh, what's the word like a table type thing where you can say like huh yeah where you can put in if i was a black male with say a bachelor's degree um what would be the difference that i could make if i was a white male rather than black or a hispanic female rather than a white male or whatever so it, it's really uh interesting to look at I love um, it telling that white male is the benchmark, right? right. Yeah. So right. It's, it's because of institutional racism and sexism that women and people of minorities have traditionally earned less. Now mm -hmm. when these settlements are happening, that's being used against them to say, well, you're not actually worth as much as a white guy. Exactly. Like, that's just so wrong on so many levels. Like, just because someone is female or Hispanic or black or something doesn't mean that they won't amount to something or they won't get certain degrees, they won't get certain jobs, they won't won't get certain promotions. Like estimating anything based on your race or your gender is kind of uh, a shitty thing to do, <laughs> I guess. Well, it, yeah. it seems like it seems like what they're doing is is going, um, you know, based on these statistics, based on based on you know the statistics that we have, up, uh, you know, showing the achievement rates or whatever of you know the the amount of people in each demographic who has who has gained a master's degree, um, we can estimate that that you will have you know this likelihood of getting that, but it's kind of backwards because it's like well, the, the, you know, the the reason those things are the way they are it, it's it's not because of the race of the person it's because of well, like like christy said institutionalized racism or sexism uh, and and the hurdles that these people face that stop them from being able to get those things is not their fault at all it's because of it's because of a system that's been stacked against them and then to use that to say well sorry uh, you probably wouldn't have got a master's degree so you you don't deserve as much money that's some bullshit out there yeah, if you if you tell someone that they're not going to amount to something, then they're probably not going to amount to something because you don't have any faith in them. Like, 
if you like, say to people, like, like, carry on. <laughs> no, no, go I'll ahead. You got Jody, and then Michael will finish. He'll go. Yeah. He'll follow up. Okay. Yeah. Like if you say to people, "Oh, you're you're worthless. You you suck." Like it's going to get into their heads, and then they'll think, "Well, maybe I do suck. Maybe I won't amount to anything." And then they won't try as hard. And so it, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Like, <laughs> like if you it's actually like, have faith um, in them, then they might amount to something. Yeah. I feel like it's like, um, you know, say you had like a, a, a sprinting race, and in each of the lanes was a whole bunch of hurdles that the people had to jump over. You had, had a whole bunch of different races. You had like a, a white guy and a black guy and a Hispanic guy and, you know, all along the thing. And the white guy had no hurdles in his thing. And, and, and because the Olympics in this case is run by white guys. So they were like, okay, so the white people don't have anything. And all the other people, they have different hurdles along the way. And they run this race a whole bunch of bajillion times. And then they get a whole bunch of statistics that say, well, you know, because you're a, bl you're, you're a black man, you're less likely to, to actually win the race that many times. Uh, so now that you're, you know, unable, you know, th this person, you're less likely to actually win the race. So we're going to not give you the prize in the end right. you know we're assessing your likelihood that you'll win the race uh and we can see that it's not as good even though we're the ones who made it this way um sorry here have a chocolate <laughs> <laughs> yeah and this is happening in court settlements you know um in the states um, you know on a regular basis so what could we do about that though what what, what is there to do about because what I mean, you could could you just say you know don't do it on those to just say well you know they're a human being they have the same chance of getting a master's degree as anyone else or what what, what do yeah, you do? Yeah, you could just pass a law saying that in these specific cases you can't consider the um, basically it's, one could argue it's um, an ecological fallacy that you are taking the characteristics of a wider population and distilling it down to an individual. So let's say that one group has a lower rate of literacy than group A than group B, and you find an individual member of group A, you can't assume that person has a low level of literacy just because they're a member of group A. You can't make those, you can't go from the aggregate to the individual. You have to actually investigate the individual and give them a literacy test and then compare them to you know, someone in group B or the average group A or whatever else. And so you get- But in the case of like, the, the in the case, case of this person, person who's like a you know they're three years old and they've, they've, they've got severe learning disabilities and stuff that is you know so we've got that and you can't assess how do you assess the likelihood that they would have gotten a master's degree well then if you want to do it by the calculations one would be to take an ag ag aggregate of all the groups and weight them or something or you could just take from the highest possible assumption okay mm -hmm. yeah I did. All right, then I guess we're on to the yeah, last story. Or unless you want to say something else, Michael? I was just going to say it's a depressing article. I read it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're a very well-read group, like being during seminars again with really engaged uh, people. I read like three <laughs> articles this week. Thank God. <laughs> we're so intelligent. <laughs> the article I chose, it's called Hostility Toward Women is One of the Strongest Predictors of Trump's Support, and it's published by Vox, which is Ezra Klein's um, online web thing, news thing. And you can read the article fully for yourself. But what I really wanted to pick out of this was the questions that the social scientists asked in order to get at this phenomenon. So from the article, researchers Carly Wayne, Nicholas Valentino, and Marzia Ociano, who wrote about their work for the Washington Post's Monkey Cage, concluded their research before the revelation of the secret recordings. Sorry, but um, so there's, these three political scientists basically found a connection between sexism, emotions, and support for Trump, and that they found that more hostile, the more hostile voters were toward women, the more likely they were to support Trump. So to get at this, these researchers measured hostility toward women, and that was one of the major factors, again, for predicting support for Trump, more strongly than authoritarian attitudes, as well as racial pre prejudice. And they used four questions to determine sexist attitudes asking if people agreed with the following statements. And I love these questions. Now, one of them I have a bit of a problem with because it's a kind of a weirdly worded question, I think, awkwardly worded, but here are the, the questions. One, 
most women interpret innocent remarks or acts as being sexist. You know, strongly agree to strongly disagree. Two, many women are actually seeking special favors, such as hiring policies that favor women over men under the guise of asking for equality. Three, feminists are not actually seeking for women to have, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a awkwardly worded question because it's negatively worded. Feminists are not actually seeking for women to have more power than men. And four, feminists are making entirely reasonable demands of men. So that was one of the questions that they asked, which I thought, oh, I would just love some people on YouTube to, to take that survey question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they talked about that as um, one form of sexism, um, a more sort of aggressive one. But there's also a way to measure an old fashioned view of the sort of traditional view of women's sexism. And here are the questions that survey respondents were asked if they agreed with the following statements. Number one, in a disaster, women should be rescued before men. Two, women have a quality of purity that few men possess. Three, men should be willing to sacrifice their own well being in order to provide for the women in their lives, for the women in their lives. Four, Every man ought to have a woman whom he adores. So these questions measure benevolent sexism. That's sort of a traditional chivalrous view of men and women's proper roles. And that's contrasted against the above ones, which are more of a hostile sexism. And hostile sexism is correlated with Trump support, but the benevolent sexism really isn't. So that I thought was a really, uh, really good uh, study and some really interesting findings. How, how many, what was the, the sample size? I would have to look into the details, which I don't know that they're in this article, but if you guys talk for a little bit, I'll see if I can figure it out. Okay. Do, do you have any thoughts on that, Jerry? Um, well, I, I think it's uh, a pretty good article. <laughs> I, I enjoyed reading it. Um, I didn't actually read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I read because this was a late edition. So it, yes, it, very it, last yeah. edition. Yeah. That's right. Well, well, I, I read Trump and I read women, and I was just like, okay, I need to read this because <laughs> <laughs> um, it's always fun to find out about Trump or Trump supporters and their views of women. Um, and yeah, uh, I I thought the questions that they asked were quite quite good, apart from like Chrissy said that awkwardly worded question, which. When I read the article, I did have to read it a couple of times to make sure I understood what the question actually was. So hopefully that didn't skew any of the data by people reading it once and thinking they knew what the question was. Uh, I have an answer for you, by the way. In June of 2016, they conducted a nationally representative survey of 700 US citizens. They also, earlier in the year, in February, they did an experiment trying to understand what was more important, like fear or anger. And so they asked a random subset of respondents to think of a time in their lives when they are either angry, scared, or relaxed, three different versions. And this is called an emotional induction manipulation, where it causes them to kind of feel these emotions. And then they were asked how much support they had for Donald Trump. And among respondents who were primed to feel afraid, the impact of sexism on support for Trump was smaller compared with the respondents primed to feel angry or relaxed. In contrast, among respondents primed to feel angry, the impact of sexism was slightly larger than those primed to feel relaxed. Relaxed. So it's anger more than fear that seems to, you know, at least in this initial study, that, that are, are linked. So that was on the mm -hmm. Monkey Cage article, by the way, which I will also put in the description box now that I've referenced it. Do they do these kind of studies for other, um, with the previous, you know, presidential nominees? Do they, you know, uh, it seems it seems kind of kind of telling of the sort of guy that Trump is that uh, that he's done a study um, about the sexism of his voters, <laughs> you know. Yeah, in terms of the, the battery of questions, that's the first time I've seen those. And I thought, other than I said, though, not, are not actually trying to do something which was awkwardly phrased. I really thought that they were tapping into a very distinct from, phenomenon from the traditional types of old-fashioned views of men and women that are probably more likely to be on surveys, but those questions aren't ones that I'd come across before. It's just, it's just kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like yeah. going in and saying, you know, how many of Trump's supporters are racist? You know, it, it's kind of, I wonder whether that's something that people are asked of, of 
previous um, presidential candidates. Jody, do you want to have give you your thoughts on this? Um, I don't really know what to say. Oh, oh. what I said earlier. <laughs> Honestly, uh, so yeah, you can carry on. <laughs> well, for me, it was really exciting to see a conceptual disambiguation of sort of sexism because the sexism battery that I'm used to is um, women should stay in the house more and men should be earning and the woman's proper place is in the home, not in the workplace and that kind of thing. That's kind of old fashioned one. But I think that, you know, there is an aspect of it that is the more aggressively hostile. The one that I think kind of links back to this idea why are, you know, like lesbian, or feminist lesbians or stuff. It's this assumption that people are looking for a special treatment. Women are complaining when they really shouldn't and that they're trying to pull one over. You know, they're trying to make their lives easier at the expense of men. And that's a very different kind of sexism than, you know, holding thinking that you have to, I don't have a problem holding doors open. I hold doors open for people. I'm a grateful one, so it holds the door open for me. But that kind of chivalrous notion of women as delicate flowers and, and men as, as nice mm -hmm. and carrying armor. Yeah, I think that's the, the kind of sexism that, um, that, that David, what's his face, focuses on quite a lot on his, um, on his blog, you know, the We Hunted the Mammoth, the, this kind of idea of new misogyny, um, which, is, which is kind of different from, uh, from that old school misogyny and and uh i think that's yeah i think it's kind of interesting as well um the what's i gonna say about that oh um i um it seems like uh i i think yeah i think it's interesting because you know you get you've got all these trump supporters and i, I don't actually know how um what I'd, I'd be interested to know how many trump supporters um actually defended him when it came to all these um, allegations of sexual abuse, and and after he said the you know the, the tapes were released and whatnot, um, because there was definitely a lot of people who kind of uh, defended those statements, uh, and I feel like that definitely shows a, a, an avert amount of sexism. Um, and I'd I'd be interested to see, um, you know, uh, what subset of his of his followers were you know did support those things because you know like I say that that definitely shows. A level of sexism as well um yeah the best time to collect that data if they were going to do it would be during the exit polling in the election next tuesday i don't know if that's a question they can fit there's a lot of fighting for space of questions because obviously what you ask is what you can study afterwards but i personally hope that they would you know maybe ask people about their reaction to trump's various comments by party and everything else you know so that we could see Generally, you're right. Democrats tend to be more offended by that kind of thing, and then Republicans tend to shrug it off if they're Trump supporters. When uh, when do we find out about? Because is voting still happening? I, I have no idea how this shit works. Yes. So right now, early voting is going on in the U.S., and I just saw this is insane. Something like 23 or 28 million votes have already been cast. It's a oh, record wow. turnout of early voting and absentee voting. And so what does the early voting mean? So early voting, like so there's two kinds of ways to do it. Um, you can do an absentee vote, and that's when you physically can't be present. Like, I have to vote absentee because I live in Germany. So I request my ballot. They give me, in this case, the state of Wisconsin sends me an Adobe PDF, and I have to tick off the boxes, and then I have to sign a piece of paper. Another American has to witness me signing it, and then I send it off. That's voting absentee. But in more places, the county clerk will open up actual sort of like locations around the city where you can go and cast your vote early you can show up in person you get a number you get your ballot and you can actually vote there on site so you don't have to do it on election day because one of the biggest problems when you have a country as big as america even if only half of the people in the country vote which i don't know what turnout's going to be this time it'd be interesting to see but trying to process all those people in a day is almost impossible and you end up with places that underestimate um, election turnout and they end up running out of ballots and people wait in line for hours and hours and it becomes ridiculous. So the Democrats yeah. especially have been making a big push to bank their vote or you know, make sure their early vote gets deposited before election day so that because it's often the poorer areas in town that get less service. You know, if you're living out in the country somewhere, there might be 700 people who vote, but if you're downtown someplace, you know, you, there might be 7,000 people voting. So what, uh, what day is election day? Tuesday. Yes. And okay. the polls close usually getting around eight in the evening around on the East coast, which will be my time, I think two in the morning. 
And if Trump loses Florida, we'll know. I mean, that it'll be over then because he doesn't have a path to 270. That doesn't include Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania's gone, but Florida is his linchpin. And if he can't win Florida, he can't win anywhere else. So if Florida goes for Clinton, we'll know very early in the evening. Why do um uh this is a very off topic question, but why why don't we vote online? Why is that not a thing? Why can't we just set it why can't there be a thing set up where everyone just goes online and goes, I vote for whoever rather than having this turn out on a specific day and fill in a piece of paper and all this weird processing shit. Surely they could set up some sort of system which would make it so much easier. Three reasons. One uh, identity theft. Mm, you true. go to vote and you someone's already voted in your name, how do you prove that it wasn't you? Two, um, hacking and manipulation. And three, it's a really good idea to have the physical ballots when, in case there's a recount. Yeah. I still feel like there would be a way to do it uh, securely and stuff, but yeah, maybe. I think if they had a, a, a thing where you could go and like lock your phone in and cast a ballot there with a specific app that you would get in a voter ID that they would have a, the same number of kind of thing, you know, but I don't know if we're ever going to get, I mean, we might get to the point where we have security enough to vote online, but with after the Russian hacking of this campaign, I don't think anybody <laughs> wants to put their election machines <laughs> on the internet. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey guys, this is coming, we are now at the end of the first episode of Feminist Talk Back. And I've had a fabulous time. Yeah, me too. Yes. Me too. And I hope the listeners have had a fabulous time too. Um, so at the moment, the idea, sorry, I'm going to mute you, Jody, because I can hear myself a little bit. At the moment, the plan is to go monthly. So there'll be another one coming up in December. But if I get caught up on my backlog of videos that I need to make, there has been a request to do this uh, every two weeks, or bi-monthly. And if that becomes a possibility in the new year and people respond, hopefully this will go well, um, then we can definitely do that. But for the December episode, we're going to be needing more questions. And I have to say, the questions this time, you guys are going to have a hard time topping them because they were damn good questions. But give it a go. Yeah, write them down, uh, throw them our way, and I will select you know, four or five for time constraints to address on air. So I guess I'll just give everybody a chance to say goodbye and again, kind of plug your channel. So Jody, if you want to go first and just say goodbye and where people can find you, also in the description box below, but your channel again? Uh, yeah, my channel is Jody Shanae, which uh, is kind of awkward to spell, so oh, sorry, I'm going to spell it out for you. Uh, it's J-O-D-Y-S-I-N-E-A-D. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Jody Sinead or Instagram again Jody Sinead. I'm not hard to find, guys. I'm just Jody Sinead everywhere. Um, <laughs> I, I'm so original. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed this. And if you ever want to invite me back, then I'll be happy to do so. It's Rebook. been great. Excellent. Huh? Rebook. Yes. No, you're not allowed. <laughs> I, I'm booking myself wow. in for New Year already. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's been lovely talking to you guys. And yeah, it, it wasn't as scary as I thought it would be. <laughs> Please yeah, do. Bro. But don't go anywhere yet. So, Michael, yeah. the people are going to be missing you for a while, but they can keep up with some of your back <laughs> content, right? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's not going to be the same without me, right? Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, like I said, probably very difficult to make videos when I'm off cruising the seas so um for the next kind of four months yeah i'm not i'm not going to be but as soon as i get back to new zealand in, in, in march i'll start making some stuff again but my channel is mr the music man michael um that's m-r-t-h-e-m-u-s-i-c-m-i-c-h-a-e-l-r-o-w-l-a-n-d-s i think <laughs> um and uh i've got a lot of stuff on there if you want to check it out if you like music as well i've just started doing guitar tutorials so if you're wanting to learn to how to do some cool guitar stuff i've started doing that as well um, as well as my old um, Why Do Anti-Feminists Hate Feminism and Truth or Teal Deer and White Knights of the Manosphere. So that stuff's all there. Um, and, you know, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and all that sort of jazz as well. So if you want to come say hi, do that. Yeah, Unless Knights I've blocked you because I use BlockBot. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, White Knights of the Manosphere has the best opening theme song of any video series that I'm aware of. You're going to have to start guesting out, doing guest music. For, <laughs> let me do one for, like, Kevin's Descent to Manosphere. Oh my god, yeah, I know. I might, <laughs> I might just be a genius. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Sometimes. 
All right, for those of you watching, thank you again for your time and attention. Uh, I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and until next time, um, goodbye.